As with many people, I became a sophomore year atheist, um, influenced by a kind of unified and consilient vision of the natural sciences as encompassing all of knowledge itself, similar to maybe Edward Wilson's vision in Consilience, his famous book. I started my professional life as a, a naturalist, a physicalist, an atheist. However, as I entered more deeply into the study of philosophy at HDS and later in my, my doctorate, I, and especially when confronting existential realities of a practicing physician, I found naturalism to be not only a sophomore year wandering, but also a sophomoric worldview, intellectually and morally inadequate for the complexity of human experience and the humane ends we seek. So I'd like to provide two illustrations from those two projects. So the first one, dehumanization and stigma, is kind of an ontological question. We can ask ourselves, what are we fundamentally? Are we persons or are we something else? I found that uh, naturalism in some sense erases our humanity. When I research modern medicine and what makes it so dehumanizing for so many of us, as a naturalist, I had so little to draw on in objecting to biomedicine's objectification of us, its reduction of the human purse to an epiphenomena of material processes and machines, a phantasm of uh, molecular motors. So how could I, as a secular humanist, object to any of this if uh, fundamentally we are wet robots, we are fancy meatballs flying through space determined by physical objects uh, in nature? So to defend our humanity in an age of this kind of biological reductionism creeping all around us, I found that we needed an account of our existence that includes but moves beyond nature's physical description. We need an account of the uniqueness of human experience that includes these complexities of consciousness, freedom, meaning, transcendence, all of which will thereby necessitate the preeminence of our moral concern for each other, our patients, and ourselves. We also need a description of the vertical dimension of life and not just its horizontal social dimension, which can be equally reductive as biological accounts. So this two-dimensional, flat, stick-figure depiction of human experience we get from naturalism, whether in its biological or social dimensions, doesn't include the fullness of, of life as we experience it, the 3D cinema we have, the painted walls of our own lives, and the embodied religious and spiritual traditions that represent them more fully. And another analogy, I guess, is we were fully human when we were playing music with all of the octaves on our piano, not just those that we can most easily touch. A second project that I mentioned is relating to how should we live? Another fundamental question. And so when I looked at Nazi medicine and how doctors were amongst the earliest joiners of the Nazi party, I really was wondering how could this have happened? Why would people who devoted their lives to healing and caring and taking certain oaths want to do such a thing? I wanted to understand how they could have come to the point of utterly disregarding human life and valorizing inequality, not just accepting inequality, domination, eugenics, and mass murder, but valorizing such things. So and again, an account of human life as a purely naturalistic process seemed to make this interpretation more likely, sociologically for sure, but also more plausible philosophically amidst this kind of naturalism. I'll be more specific with an example. So we all know Darwin's most famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. So that's the title you, you see in your syllabi and um, elsewhere, but most people truncate or forget or deliberately ignore the last part of the title. You can look it up and Google it yourself. I'll read it here. So on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. It's not, I didn't make that up. Look it up yourself. So there is a connection between a naturalistic interpretation of human existence and racism, eugenics, genocide, and even, even in the title of Darwin's book. We call that social Darwinism and, and call it pseudoscience, but there's really something to it for the Nazis and for others today. So you add into that some Nietzschean flourishes about the death of God and the dismissal of an eternal moral law and include some objections that Nietzsche had to moral equality for the sake of a higher collective flourishing or special community, whether it's the nation or family or the Volk. And being a Nazi doctor has a rationale in this worldview, in this materialistic, naturalistic worldview however disturbing this is to us today. So those are two touch points for scholarship and personal study that I thought I'd share. It was hard for me to find a kind of an objection to the kind of practices described here without sneaking in some kind of or another theological premise. For example, that humans are sacred, they're morally equal, they're inviolable, they have dignity and rights. How could you justify, how can we justify these premises otherwise? Dissect a human body, you won't find any molecule for rights, sacredness, equality, or dignity. Pick any physical capacity that humans have and try and name it as a basis for our equality, our will, our reason, our intelligence, our consciousness. We will find people who vary in that very capacity, some with more and some with less. Therefore, no physical capacity can stand as a ground and warrant for our human equality. 
So the logic of the Nazi doctors and researchers is quite consonant with, there's a reason why that logic is also consonant with many contemporary secular utilitarian arguments. For example, for discriminating against and kill inconvenient infants, elderly, disabled, to serve some greater good of other people or communities. So this is where I see our great spiritual and religious traditions as being able to offer a kind of reply, a deontological no, and doing so for not just random reasons, but coherent reasons that are grounded in the very nature of things, the very nature of ontology. So whereas a purely naturalistic or atheistic approach to human life would have a hard time doing so, maybe logically impossible time doing so.